Welcome to the Naval War College. This is the International Law Department's presentation on collateral damage estimation methodology. I'm Major Jeff Thurner with the U.S. Army. This is Major Tim Kelly with the U.S. Marine Corps. Both of us are faculty members here in the International Law Department. And today we're going to give you a presentation that's drawn from a class that we attended recently at the Joint Targeting School. Uh, from the onset, I want to make it clear that both of us are military attorneys. We are not experts in the collateral damage estimate, or CDE, process. But our goal today is to provide you with some basics so that you can kind of understand the general underlying principles and so that you're, you can be conversant in the subject and understand ultimately what the, the process outputs are. So when you hear the final CDE call is CD level whatever, you understand what that means. Additionally, this presentation should give you an appreciation for the process and the careful approach that the U.S. forces take to eliminate collateral damage. Now, other nations have developed similar systems, but today we are going to be focused solely on the U.S. system. As military lawyers who work in the area of law of armed conflict, we frequently discuss issues uh, such as proportionality, distinction, and precautions in attack. The CDE process takes account of these issues and provides a structure for determining the appropriate level commander who, may, who will make the decision regarding whether, and in some instances, the method and weapon used to strike a target. Uh, we'll mention that, that throughout the presentation that some aspects of the CDE methodology are classified. This is an unclassified presentation, so we will not, we will not be discussing any of those classified items. Uh, with that said, let's look, take a look at the general CDE methodology. All right, thanks, Tim. First thing we're going to start is show you the references. As you see, the primary reference is the Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff's Instruction 3160.01. That really is uh, the bulk. It shows you how to walk through this process that we're going to do today. There are some tables that are associated with that. Those are classified tables. We're, we're not going to be referring to those, but we'll talk generally about uh, how that process works. Now, the reason that this methodology was developed in the first place is because there were some perceived problems in the 1990s when the, when we, the U.S. was trying to conduct targeting. The, the issues were that s estimates of collateral damage varied depending on what unit was doing the calculation, what service, what the location was, and so it became apparent that we needed to have a unified approach to this. As you can see, the quote from General Zinni, one of the major proponents of the development of the system, was that he wanted something simple, logical, and repeatable. So something that he could even do himself. So that if you're sitting in Afghanistan, or in Tampa, or in Washington, D.C., if you're given a certain fact scenario about a target, proposed target, you would come up with essentially the same estimate for the amount of collateral damage that would be caused. That was the genesis for it. And when you take a look at the methodology itself, You'll see that it is, is now a logical framework, and it gives you a process for estimating these things. It uses empirical data, so there's certainly a lot of scientific research that's been done to determine this, to try to give you the best estimate for the amount of collateral damage that may be caused by a particular strike. This system is across the board. It applies to uh, all services, and it also applies at all levels of combat, so at, from the tactical level up to the strategic level. The other key thing to remember is that this is for deliberate uh, pl deliberately planned targets. So it's not for hasty operations or something where it's going to affect the commander's time-sensitive targets that he's interested in engaging. And when you look broadly at what this process is, it's when you're looking at the legal aspect of what this is trying to uh, cover, it's, it's not exactly trying, it's not really a proportionality question that you're trying to answer. It's really more a precautions and attack approach. It's showing the feasible steps that the U.S. is taking in order to minimize civilian uh, and collateral damage. Uh, it's also primarily about the level of command that can approve a various strike. So depending on how, depending on how far down the CD process we get, um, depending on how grave the concern may be about collateral damage, it'll tell you what level commander has to approve a strike. Uh, when there's really no, no concern, it could be a lower level. But as you get higher up, uh, it's going to require up to some of the highest levels uh, in the National Command Authority to approve those strikes. So that's really a, a broad framework for what we're looking at. Now, the reason we have this approach is because uh, there's significant strategic risk if we fail to properly uh, account for collateral damage and properly uh, take steps to, to, to minimize the amount of damage that we cause from a certain strike. So to avoid those sort of st strategic risks, we have developed, or the U.S. has developed, this methodology uh, that we're going to walk you through today. Before we get into the methodology itself, I want to cover a few terms and uh, issues related to collateral damage estimation. The, 
first being is what is collateral damage itself. Uh, 3160.01 addresses collateral damage, as you can see on the slide, as follows. It is the unintentional or incidental injury or damage to persons or objects that would not be lawful military targets in the circumstances ruling at the time. Such damage is not unlawful so long as it is not excessive in light of the overall military advantage anticipated from the attack. Any uh, questions or comments on that uh, on that definition at all? Is that is that definition the accepted definition internationally, or is that specific to the U.S.? Well, it's it's particularly derived from, like I said, from uh, Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staff Instruction 3160.01, which is a U.S. document. So that is the U.S. view. Um, I can tell you that from the point of view of additional protocol uh, one that they address collateral damage in, in, uh, in the following manner. They, an attack which may be expected, this is um, a prohibition against indiscriminate attacks. An attack which may be expected to cause incidental loss of civilian life, injury to civilians, damage to civilian objects, or a combination thereof which would be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated. So you see with uh, AP1, which, which most of the rest of the world would uh, adhere to in the U.S. view, um, not a lot of difference, but you will see was, while both of them uh, mention the direct military advantage anticipated, AP-1 also includes the term uh, expected to cause. Now that's, while, while not specifically addressed in the, uh, the U.S. view, um, it, it's, it's clear that the US po in U.S. policy the collateral damage estimation is, is, is uh, calculated with the knowledge that the commander had at the time of approving the target, you know, carried through until execution on the target. This, this isn't something that's done after the fact with a battle damage assessment and then someone second guesses after the fact that uh, the, the, um, whether the, the actual damage was uh, excessive in light of the military advantage gained. Is there, sorry, I have one more question. Is there a difference between the overall military advantage and what I think read from AP1 saying the direct, or sorry, the concrete and direct military advantage. Is that another difference in the interpretation? I, I don't know that it would be a, um, a substantive difference other than, you know, the uh, use of a couple of different terms, but I think the... Well, I think it's a little broader, though. It basically gives us a broader view, so you're able to look at the full battlefield and determine if this attack in relation to the whole battlefield is if that attack would have a substantial, or would be the gain is excessive, or the damage is excessive to that gain, versus looking at that particular aspect of the fight. Because, for instance, feints or other things where maybe that the direct advantage of that attack is not so high, but in the light of an overall battle, well, yeah, the overall gain is significant. So we're not looking at just this fight against the damage caused. We're looking at how it fits into the overall context. So I, I think that that little nuanced difference it, it is, is apparent in, in the definitions. Now specifically, why do we co conduct a CD analysis and what questions does the process seek to answer? Uh, generally speaking, there, there's five simple questions that need to be answered before engaging any target. First is can you positively identify the target as a legitimate military target authorized under the current rules of engagement? Second, are there collateral objects or persons or significant environmental concerns within the effects range of the weapons that you'd like to use. Uh, third, can you mitigate damage to those collateral concerns by attacking the target with a different weapon or method of engagement and yet still accomplish your mission? Moving on, fourth, if, um, if you cannot mitigate those uh, effects, how many non-combatants do you think will be killed or injured in the attack? And finally, uh, are the collateral attacks of your, are the collateral effects of your attack excessive in relation to the expected military advantage gained, and do you need permission um, from a higher commander in order to execute that that target? The um, the ge geographic combat commander responsible for an area of uh, operation promulgates two different target lists. The first being a no-strike list, and on this no-strike list, the um, 
all identified objects within a specific geographic range, which are functionally characterized as non-combatant or civilian in nature, are listed on there. And as the uh, the name of the list uh, indicates, these are not to be struck. Also. Um, there's a, a restricted target list, and that's where a geographic combatant commander has imposed certain uh, weapons effects or certain uh, certain restrictions on uh, different targets, and that could be for political reasons or intelligence gain loss reasons or or um, uh, or certain policy reasons or whatnot. Uh, now we're talking about pre-planned targeting here, so if for instance, someone wanted to strike a target that was on one of these lists, you would have to go back to the geographic combatant commander, and if it was on the no-strike list, have it removed from that list uh, by the competent authority and potentially move to the restricted list, or get per permission uh, to use the, the particular weapon you're looking at for the restricted target list. Another concept I just want to go over um, prior to getting into the uh, the methodology itself is dual-use targets. Uh, dual-use targets are those targets that are characterized as having both military and civilian purpose. And the U.S. policy is they require a casualty estimation where you count everyone within that structure as a non-combatant civilian casualty. Um, go ahead. Sorry. Why, why would you count everyone as a non-combatant? civilian casualty if it's dual use? The, the um, well, our, our, the U.S. Uh, directives require that, and, and really it just shows the extensive caution that the, the, the uh, U.S. system takes uh, in taking into account the, the number of collateral casualties you'll have uh, caused, by, caused by a strike. And we, we have to remember, we go back to this, this methodology doesn't necessarily approve, doesn't approve or disapprove a strike. It assigns the appropriate level of commander who can approve a strike. So you could run into dangers if you counted some of the people and not some of the people where you potentially have a lower level commander uh, approving a strike where really because of the dual nature of that, um, that structure it should be handled at a higher level command. With regard to uh, human shields as they come up, um, Human shields are non-combatants that are intentionally placed near a valid military target uh, to hinder the attack. We could have two different types of those. We could have voluntary ones, or excuse me, in, involuntary human uh, human shields, and those are people that are against their will have been placed near a military target, um, and those must be accounted for in any casualty estimation. You also may run into a, a situation of voluntary human shields, people who, you know, potentially uh, support one side or another, not necessarily uh, involved in armed conflict itself, but willingly place themselves in harm's way in front of a in front of a military target in order to hinder the attack. The uh, the U.S. view is that, that while involuntary human shields must be accounted for in a casualty estimation, uh, voluntary human shields would not be accounted for. Um, does sorry does the is that an in, uh, is there consensus in the international community about that point of view, or is there, is it discussed? I, I wouldn't say there's a consensus uh, in the international community, but it is uh, not uncommon for, that the other view would be held with regard to voluntary human shields, and that some nations that the U.S. operates with may count not only involuntary human, uh, human shields, but also voluntary human shields in their casualty estimation. Uh, and it's important to note if uh, U.S. doesn't know the, uh, the nature of the human shield, we treat them all as involuntary. So if our intel is not sufficient that, that we know whether they're involuntary or, or voluntary, we, we treat them as involuntary. And then uh, finally, before we move into the, um, the uh, methodology itself, I want to uh, just go over a couple things with regard to weapons effects considerations. First being, wh what are the, uh, the primary causes of collateral damage? The, the, the first and most significant cause of, of collateral damage is pit failure. What that means is that although we believed a target to be of a certain functionality, of a certain use, of a certain nature, in effect there was some sort of error that, that uh, um, the, the target was fault, uh, it, um, identified as a lawful military target in error. The second, uh, and, and that's a, the, the majority of collateral, collateral damage uh, causes. 
The second would be a weapons malfunction. Quite simply, the, uh, the weapon doesn't uh, work as, as, as uh, it was designed or as it was planned. And then third would be a conscious decision. Now, now realize when we say conscious decision here, we're not talking about somebody that's intentionally targeting uh, civilians, because that wouldn't be collateral damage. That would be a war crime. Um, with, a con with a conscious decision, we, we mean here, and you'll see as we go through the collateral damage estimation process, is that at some, po at some point, um, we can expect that our weapons will have collateral, will have uh, adverse collateral consequences, uh, collateral casualties. And uh, at the end of the uh, proportionality analysis, the appropriate level commander uh, makes the decision that the expected military advantage gain, uh, that the collateral damage is not excessive in, in light of the expected military advantage gain and improves the target. Um, so we prosecute that target with the knowledge that there may be collateral damage. Um, there's also issues with delivery accuracy. The U U.S. probably has the most uh, accurate weapons in the world and continually strives with research and development to get more and more accurate weapons. However, we still have some issues, target location error. Uh, we do still rely on humans at some point in, in pinpointing a target to, and uh, determining exactly where it is. There could be a, a map error, what's, what have you, that could add up to a an error in the actual location of the target um, in, in, the, in, uh, in real life. And then finally, uh, guidance or de delivery system variation. As I mentioned, the U.S. has made strides, the world has made strides in, in uh, increasing the accuracy of weapon systems. However, they're still prone to some variation. Then uh, finally, the collateral damage methodology does not account for weapons malfunctions. Quite simply, there would be no, no process if you tried to account for every, every different malfunction that, that, that could happen to a weapon. And then it also does not account for unknown transient non-combatant personnel um, and their property in the area of the target. So does that mean, so for example, if you knew, if, if, you, were, if you were somewhere in the middle of nowhere and you had intel that there were people coming through, how would that be dealt with then? The, it, Right. Or civilians coming through, I should say. Yeah. It, it, within the methodology, unknown transient non-combatant combat personnel are not uh, accounted for. And you'll see, uh, I think, as the as we, we walk you through the, the methodology, why that is, and because it is a, you know, it's a mathematical to some degree system. Um, however, if there were a known transient that was not expected to be in the area, not, not generally the usual person that would be in that area, but was known, that would clearly be briefed to the commander and in, incorporated into the, uh, the targeting analysis, the proportionality analysis, the precautions in attack, all those sorts of things. Um, no, known intel is going to be accounted for in all that. This raises an issue, though, of time lag. Um, you know, you've got this methodology where you're taking into account all these factors, and it, it comes to mind when you talk about these unknowns that might enter into the the sphere that you're operating in in terms of the target zone, I guess, or the, the targeted object, and the fact that is there a time delay there that you go through this whole methodology, and by the time you go through that methodology, there is now this room for the environment to change so that transients can enter. I guess, I, I guess maybe you'll get to this in terms of the time factor, that this methodology takes time, and then, you know, does that time affect what then happens, you know, in terms of the target itself? Or is that accounted for in the methodology? Well, well ma'am, I think what you'll see is that the, the uh, CDE takes this, the, uh, the target and looks at it as it would normally be and accounts for different variations, night, day, we'll talk about that, episodic events and that. But it doesn't necessarily seek to... Um, provide an output that reflects real time. It reflects what can be expected under the general circumstances that prevail in the area of that target. So if you had particular um, intel, it would opt you out of that. And, and instead of looking at something as you expect it to be under normal circumstances, you would it, it would be analyzed under what we know it to be. For instance, if we had some sort of surveillance on the target or something like that, that would, that would potentially, as you, I think you'll see as we go through the CD analysis, that would, to some degree almost would opt you out of that type of uh, CD analysis and, and as opposed to 
or to put you into one where we know the uh, the uh, actors in the area. Right. I mean, I think it's continuing duty. So if you now know of somebody in the area, then that would change the analysis. And then it, we don't continue to go forward on a strike saying, well, beforehand we thought there was nobody. Even though we know there's somebody now, uh, we're still going to engage because we already had approved at this level. So it would, it would now change the calculus, and we'd have to go back and get a new approval if you had a known new person in the area. The, the idea about not taking into account the unknown transients is that we don't have a fudge factor. We don't say, oh, maybe somebody else is going to happen to walk through this area, so we'll plan for that contingency. We don't plan for those contingencies. We plan for what's known. And so if we don't know of anybody, then we'll make an assessment based on that. If intel later on comes and shows that that was incorrect, well, then, yeah, we'd absolutely take that new intelligence into account and have to go relook at, at our target engagement at that point. And that made me think how, uh, maybe you'll talk about this as well, but how long approximately is this process? I mean, your question made me think that, at the, like, from start to finish. Sure. It, I mean, it varies depending on, um, depending on your area. But for instance, operations that are ongoing in Afghanistan, they have teams that have CD analysts that have been pushed forward into theater from Central Command uh, who are making those calculations. And, and you're, you're, can, they can get those counts down to, uh, you know, 15 minutes. I mean, it can be a relatively short period of time depending on the situation, obviously, in order to make that call. So. Okay, well, now I want to take a look at the methodology itself. And we're going to take a look at the various levels of what CDs. And, and before I even talk about the levels, though, I guess I want to talk about the process. And that there's two different process processes that are happening. You have a weaponeering process where a, um, a target is identified, and then the weaponeer is going to look and see what weapons are available, see what weapons make most sense for this circumstance, and it's going to make a recommendation based upon that, that they want to attack this target with this particular weapon. So they'll identify the precision guided munition, the uh, aircraft that they want to use, all those sort of things. And at that point, when the weaponeering is done, it will then be passed over to a CD analyst who will take a look at the situation and make sure uh, and identify what the CD level is appropriate for that call. And then you'll be able to see which level of command then must approve that strike uh, and whether, in fact, uh, the recommended munition that the weaponeer has come up with would, in fact, give you, you know, would, would give you a level that you'd want to that you'd want to use that, or there may be recommendations to use a various other type of weapon, and the CDA analyst will help uh, help that part of the process. So there's kind of two things happening subsequent, I guess, but somewhat also a little bit in parallel. Uh, they can kind of go back and forth to, to help get you to the point that you're looking to, so that you have def definite understanding of who can authorize the attack and, and what is the best method for doing that. Okay, when you look at the CDA portion, so now after the weaponeer has, has given us that information, CDA analyst will take a look through five different levels. Uh, and he will look to stop, obviously, at whichever level he is confident that the collateral damage uh, concerns have been uh, identified or have been uh, mitigated enough that he can then approve it. So we're going to, I think it'll be clear once we kind of walk through. There's two things that happen when you first begin the process, uh, when you first get the information. You're going to, the CD analyst is going to make sure that, in fact, the target has been identified and that there is a geospatial identification of the target so you know what you're looking at, what house you're looking at, or what building or structure. Uh, and also that there is enough information for that to be positively identified as a valid military target. So you're looking at those kind of background issues. If you don't have that, if for whatever reason you aren't clear which house it is or you're not clear uh, if the target is, in fact, a valid, mil target, valid military target, you would stop at that point and you would not go for it. You would, would not be engaged in CD analysts would stop it and say, we're not going to engage that target. Similarly, the other thing they're checking for is whether there are any law of war violations in attacking that target, whether there's any ROE violations. And if you have those sort of things, then again, the CD analyst will say, no, we're, we're not going to attack this because uh, we're not complying with, with those rules. So that's kind of an initial check. The other thing they're checking early on is whether there is uh, any sort of dual use, uh, if this is a dual use facility that may be damaged uh, or will be attacked. Uh, whether there's a chemical hazard, an environmental hazard, any of those sort of things. If you have those, then you know that ultimately you're going to get to CD level 5. Uh, any of those three things is going to lead you, no matter where you are in the process, if, you, if you're able to stop earlier, basically you aren't, because you're going to have to go to CD level 5. That's, that's kind of mandated through the system, uh, that if you run into those. Okay, with that basic understanding, let's walk through the methodology itself, and hopefully it'll become a little clearer as we talk through. Now, first we're going to look at CD level 
one. This is the initial target validation, the initial assessment. The CD analyst will be given the target. He will take a look at, uh, you know, do those first checks we just talked about, and then he'll take a look at where that target is located on the ground and what collateral concerns are in the area. He'll take a look and he will establish a collateral effects radius. Now, the distance for that radius, that, that's part of the, you'd use the classified table. So there's a classified number, how many meters away from the target you'd be looking for, and this is for all attacks. CD level one is the same for whether you're using precision guided munitions or unguided munitions or surface to surface munitions. There's a fixed amount. Uh, clearly that's a pretty wide area, so we're looking at many hundreds of meters out. Uh, he would do a box around the uh, around the target and ensure that nothing falls within that. And in this case, as you see here on the first slide, you'll see that the collateral concern number one falls outside of that box. So when, he's, when the CDAS is looking there, he sees there are no collateral concerns in the area, and so he's able to make a CD1 low, which means yes, you can approve this strike at a CD level one, which means whichever commander is authorized to approve CD level one can in fact authorize that attack because there are no uh, there are no collateral concerns that are within that collect collateral effects radius. So, and that number, the, the distance that we that uh, is around that building is essentially what science has shown the the biggest of the bombs or the the most uh, the largest risk that we have. Uh, that's the value that we use for for CD level one. So, take the worst case scenario essentially. What is the worst case scenario? As long as nothing is within that worst case scenario box, well, then we'd be authorized at CD level one. As you see, as you build, if there was, in fact, a collateral concern that was inside of that box, now we would have a problem. We would not be able to uh, approve that strike at CD level 1. So now we would be forced to advance to CD level 2. And at CD level 2, we're going to start to look at some of the other aspects of the, um, of the round. We're going to look at the class of weapon. So when you take a look at CD level 2, there's three different approaches. This is really where it separates into three different approaches. We will either follow the approach of precision guided munitions, where uh, we, we follow the 2A, 3A, 4A path, uh, or you look at a path of an unguided, an air-to-surface unguided, or a surface-to-surface -surface ballistic munition. Now, again, I told you the weaponier is already giving you this information, so the weaponier has specified in advance of the CD analyst getting it, we intend to use this particular weapon, and then you would follow those particular paths. Now, today we only have a short amount of time, so we are going to focus solely on the precision guided munitions. We are going to stay on that top track. Uh, the other two tracks, the uh, air-to-surface unguided and the surface-to-surface, -surface, those tracks are somewhat similar. They have some, um, some differences. Certainly, they use different values for the, the classified tables applying to those. Um, the, the one thing I will tell you about those systems is in the CD level two, the first check really is a feasibility check. And if it's determined that it's not feasible to use those types of munitions, there's a recommendation back to the commander at that point that the commander should instead look to use precision guided munitions instead of uh, either the un unguided or the surface to surface. So that's the first step. But anyway, we are not going to discuss the rest of those process. We are going to strict solely to precision guided. So let's take a look at the example as an, an example in CD level two where we are looking at a precision guided munition. So the weapon here has told us we're using precision guided munition. Now we take a look. We have our outer box, okay? That CD level one box that showed us the distances that were appropriate. Now what we do is we take what is the worst case scenario for a precision guided munition? What would be the, the biggest concern for any precision guided munition? We're not looking at the specific type of weapon here. We're just looking, looking at the class of weapons. So we're looking at all precision guided. So you take the worst case scenario for a precision guided munition, and you essentially draw a, a, a radius around the target, and you look for collateral concerns. Now in this particular case, you see that the collateral concern is outside of that CD ring. So you're able to make an appropriate call. The CD analyst can make the call there that this target is authorized under CDE level 2 low, as long, again, as you're using the, P, the precision guided munition, the PGM. And this, in this case, it's a unitary strike versus a, a cluster strike. So a unitary strike on that target would be appropriate at a, PG, at a CD level 2 uh, call. But if a collateral concern, as you see with the next build, if the collateral concern is actually within that circle, and, and even though it's just barely in the circle, as you see here, if any part of that lies within that effects radius, then we're not able to make a CD level 2 call. You're now forced to continue on to a CD level 3. So it just takes a, a, a small part of that building to be within that circle, and it's going to bump you up to the next level. Okay, when we take a look 
at CD level 3, now we are focusing on the specific type of munition that's used. Again, the weaponier will have provided that information to the CD analyst, told him what particular munitions he's going to use. Again, we're staying all within the realm of precision guided, so all the things we're going to talk about today are precision guided munitions. So, in this particular case, the weaponier is told uh, the CD analyst that they would intend to use a Mark 82 round, uh, a particular type of a precision guided munition. So, we now analyze this under CD level 3. And there's two different things that we look at in, in, in CD level 3. You look at an unmitigated and a mitigated, um, but are both specific for that type of munition. So, you look at how damaging is a Mark 82 round, is essentially the concern. In science, the, the tables, the classified tables that are provided as part of the, provided for the CD analyst will tell them, based on that research, how much damage can be expected to be caused from a Mark 82 round that lands on that target. Uh, unmitigated means it's just dropped as is. And so we would have a circle, as you can see uh, on that slide, that shows an unmitigated ring. So it shows what sort of damage would be caused regardless of, of or if you just dropped a Mark 82 onto that particular target. And you'd look for collateral concerns. In this case, there are none within the circle. So you would be able to appropriately make a CD level 3 low call with a precision guided munition Mark 82. There would be no issue. Concern would be, what if that collateral concern was actually within that unmitigated round? Now you look at ways to mitigate the effects of that round. And you can mitigate through doing things like air bursting, shielding, offsetting where your aim point is, uh, adjusting the heading. And one of the main ones that's used is delayed fuse. With a delayed fuse, what you do is you ensure that the round, when it hits that target, it will not explode until it is with inside of the structure of that target. So it's an, it'll cause an internal explosion in the, the target building, uh, which would minimize the amount of collateral damage that you'd have, or the mineral, mineral, minimize the amount of damage that'll occur outside. So you end up with a smaller ring. Instead of that big outside unmitigated ring, you would deal with a much smaller mitigated ring. And again, the tables would tell you what that amount is. The science will tell you a delayed fuse, which goes inside of that structure and then explodes. Or if it misses the structure, a it, it, uh, delayed fuse would also ensure that it's buried in the ground before it explodes. So you're going to have far less of a concern. So you'd have a much smaller ring as you see here on this next build. Now you look at that mitigated ring, and if, in fact, as this case shows, that there is no collateral concern within that mitigated collateral effects radius, then you'd be able to make the call of a CD level 3 low PGM with a Mark 82, and then you put the caveat on there that it's only with the delayed fuse. Because if you weren't using delayed fuse, as you see, it would be within that unmitigated ring. But so here we would have no issue. Here, the next build shows you that, unfortunately, here the collateral concern would be inside of that unmitigated, or would be inside of that mitigated ring. So even when you've taken all the steps to, uh, to delay the fuse, to try and shrink that circle as small as you can, you still are going to ha have a collateral concern that is affected by this attack. So now we're forced at that point to proceed to the CD level 4, which gives you a more refined assessment. You take a look at CD4, a couple things that we're looking at uh, in particular are now we are mainly, or we're primarily concerned, the main focus is a indoor, it's an indoor concern. We're worried about the blast damage to the surrounding buildings, the collateral bu buildings outside. And so because of that, we're focusing on what is the composition, what is the makeup of that particular building that's closest to you. So you're worried about is it a wood building or is it a brick building because those buildings are affected differently based upon the, uh, the blast. And so I'll show you how that works. So as we go to CD level 4, the analyst is going to take a look, and he needs to know what sort of structure that is. What is the composition of that building? So in this particular case, he, uh, the CD analyst is, is informed that it's a multi-story masonry building. So it's a brick building. It's a couple stories tall. So you can imagine that it would be a rather, uh, you can expect it to be uh, much more substantial to be able to withstand some sort of types of, certain amounts of blast damage without being negatively affected. And all of that has been calculated, and that's what the CD level 4 tables would tell you, the classified tables would tell you how, how much damage would a Mark 82 that hits that target, how much would it cause for a uh, multi-story masonry building, but those values would be identified. And so it would give you a particular radius. So you'd look at it, and if in this case you had a multi-story masonry building at that distance away from a target, again, all of the, the distances themselves are classified, but you can assume in this case, as the picture, as the picture shows, that it's outside of the effects radius of a Mark 82. So you would end up with a CD level 4 low uh, PGM strike again, again with a Mark 82, delayed fuse, which you're doing to mitigate the damage, 
Uh, and then you're also adding in CD level, you add the heading. So the heading goes from 0 all, all the way around 90, 180, 270, 360. So it's showing you that you want the aircraft to take off and go off to the right-hand side of the target because if, as often, uh, or as sometimes there is a tendency for some of the rounds to go long, if the round were to go long, it would avoid all the other collateral concerns that you see on the left hand and the bottom side of the, of the, uh, of the target itself. So you add the heading. So in this case, you would have no issue. Uh, the the CD analyst would make it a CD level 4. And with those caveats, and the commander at CD level 4 could approve a target, could approve a strike on this target uh, based upon that. But if instead of it being a multi-story masonry building, if instead that building is just a single story adobe building, so it's the same distance away, Okay, the same distance away, but it's a different composition of the building. So instead of being a nice, sturdy brick building, you have just a single-story adobe building. Well, that building is going to have, is not going to be able to withstand the impact the same as a brick building would. And so the CD level 4 tables would give you a very different value if you knew that that building was a adobe building. And it would, in fact, give you a circle, as you can see here, which is far outside of that, that, that circle that we had for a brick building. So in this case, now that it's that you that you learn that it's a single story Adobe building, you would not be able to approve that strike at a CD level four. It would have to go on to the CD level five, and so you would need a higher level commander to approve that strike. Again, CD four is all about the type, the composition of the building that really affects uh, what sort of damage is caused by the strikes, and then would lead you to believe in this case that you need to go to CD level five, which is the last level, and we'll talk about CD five. When you get to CD level 5, you are assuming now that you are going to cause collateral damage, that there will be, uh, unfortunately, people killed. So as much as you've mitigated it, as much as the other steps you've taken to try and um, make a tight a circle as possible, the surrounding buildings, the collateral buildings, based because of their type and because of their uh, proximity to the target structure, they will be damaged, and you can anticipate that people would be killed. So now we're at CD level 5. What we do is we look at the surrounding buildings and we look at what they are used for. So last, in CD4, you're worried about the composition. Now you're worrying about what is the building, what's the purpose of the building? Is it a house or is it a market? Is it a warehouse? You know, those sort of things because uh, under CD5, we've, the U.S. has developed population density tables where they tell you, based upon what the structure is used, how many people can be expected to be in that structure during the daytime or at night, or during some sort of episodic event. And so you'll have a differing number of people that you can expect to be in that building based upon what it's used for. Uh, and then you compare, ultimately, uh, we'll walk you through how you do that, but ultimately when you're given a, a number of expected casualties, you then compare that against a limit that the commander has established for being appropriate in these circumstances. Now one thing to understand about the CD process, and particularly about the casualty estimate, is that it's not an exact science. Uh, there, you know, it uses science, it uses a lot of research to try and develop this, but it's impossible to tell the exact number of people who would be killed in all these strikes. So it is the best estimate, though, uh, that the U.S. has been able to develop. So let's take a look at an example of CD Level 5. So we have a target, and we have two different collateral concerns uh, that are both within that, C that last circle that we looked at, the CD Level 4. So we, we are unable to mitigate away from them. We know that we're going to cause damage to the Adobe structure just uh, to the north of the target, and also to the masonry structure to the west. But now, again, as I told you in CD Level 5, we're worrying about what are the facilities used for, okay? Not just what the composition is, but in 5, you're worrying about what is the purpose of them. So it's important to know that the one to the west is a warehouse, and okay, that'll affect how many people you can expect to be there on the daytime, at night, and, and on any sort of episodic event. And the one to the north is a single-family urban house. So based upon that, It'll help you determine what, what you can expect for population density, who, how many people you can expect to be inside of those homes at, at those various times. Okay, the other thing that we look at is the, now we look once more at the proximity to the target. And you basically take that smallest circle that you had already developed from CD4 and you cut it in half. And that, the inner circle is called the inner annulus. And the outer ring then is called the outer annulus. The, Assumption is that anything that is in the inner annulus, so it's that close to the target, you can assume that when the strike hits the target, that everything within that smaller circle essentially would be killed. And so you would be using a casualty factor of one. You'd be assuming that everything in that structure, uh, unfortunately, would, would be killed. But in the outer annulus, because of the way blasts dissipate over time or over distances, 
you can expect a smaller portion of the people in those outer rings to be killed. So you're coming up with a different factor. In this case, 0.25 we'll use as being the factor of the, the, type, the, the amount of people that would be killed out in the outer ring. Yes? When you're, are you looking also at what potential damage might happen to objects as well as people for collateral damage? Or, I mean, not you, but does the CDE take the, that into account? The, the estimates are all based upon casualties, so they're focusing on the number of people that are, that are killed in the strikes. So the CD5 is a strict casualty estimation, so it's going to tell you the number of people that would be killed. And, and essentially, the process is looking specifically at people that are going to be killed. And certainly, things such as buildings that are going to be damaged would be factored into it, but it's mainly looked at to know if we are going to kill innocent people. Uh, and that's what we're concerned about. And that, that's what kind of drives the, the level of approval that needs to the level of the commander that would have to approve a certain strike is based on the number of people that potentially uh, would be killed from the strike. Okay, so you have the inner and the inner out of annulus, which helps tell you, it helps you, it's going to help you define or determine the amount of unfortunate people that would, that would be killed in the strike. The other thing that you're worrying about is the size of the structures and the amount of the structure that's actually, um, the amount of the structure that's affected by a particular attack. So you, you would have imagery annulus that would tell you um, how much of the building is actually covered by the strike. So if you see the, the structure to the west there, you see that only a percentage, say 40% of that structure is affected. Uh, when the strike hits the target, that portion of the building would be affected. And so we'll use that percentage in our calculations because not everyone in the building would be affected, only the people in that portion. Um, whereas the building to the north, CC1 that you see on the, on the, on the slide, you would anticipate that everything in that building would be affected, so we're going to use the entire 100% of that building. Okay, so essentially what is established, we have a little table that we've done, a little um, worksheet for you at the top, and it shows you the breakdown. So we have the two structures, CC1 and CC2. The first is the single family urban home, and the second is the warehouse. We look at the total square footage of the facility and how much of it is affected with the, with the house. All of it is affected, so we're using a factor of one. So all 700 square feet are affected. And then we look at the population density tables. And you're looking at how many people in this region. And one thing I didn't mention, but it is important, uh, I'll mention it now, is that for the population density tables, they are done very specifically per, per area of operation, uh, done per country. Uh, these are things that are established. So it's in that particular area how many people live in a home, how many people can be expected to live in a single family home. And it would certainly vary depending on what part of the world you're in. So again, we look at our particular area that we're focusing on this target. How many people are expected to be in that single family home? Well, in this case, based on the population density table, for instance, we'd say that one person per thousand square feet uh, is in that building during the daytime, where three people per thousand square feet would be there at night. Using those calculations, we'd end up with, if we did cost the, if we did attack that target, we would end up having casualties of one person during the day and three persons at night if we attacked the single family home. Then you look at the warehouse, CC2. You look at the warehouse, it's a much larger structure, it's 5,000 square feet, but only 40% of that building is affected. So uh, the affected area is 2,000 square feet, and you look at the population density tables, which tell you generally per 1,000 square feet that you have one person. Uh, in the in the warehouse per day and half and essentially half uh, at night um, and since it's 2,000 square feet you end up with totals of two people during the day and one person who would presumably be expected to be in that building at nighttime so if you attacked you as you see on the, the worksheet you'd end up with totals of three people who would be killed in this strike between the two buildings uh, if we attacked at day and you would have four people who would be attacked at night that's your CD five casualty estimation. Based upon that, you would then look at what the commander has authorized the strike. What, what is the non-combatant value for this strike? And if the casualty estimate, uh, you, you take a look at it, if that number, you, you compare the two. If the strike, for, if for instance, the commander had authorized attacks that were, that would cause four uh, casualties or, or fewer, then uh, you would be able to attack at day or at night. But if the commander had only authorized attacks that caused three, well then under a five series you would, you would only be able to do that one at a five low. Anytime it exceeds that amount, it goes to a five high. And that's, that's essentially where we get a five. And again, the di it's again a differing commander based upon a five low or a five high who has to approve the strike. 
and we're going to walk you through one full example. Tim will walk you through an example where you start from start to finish so you can see how this process works, how you would go from one up to potentially five, depending on the, the casualties in the area. Okay, so let's take a look at a proposed target and a um, proposed uh, weapon that we want to use for it, uh, use against it. And this will be, um, I'm just going to cut out some of the, the math and the note work, but this will give you a good overview of how you would uh, proceed through the process. First off, we want to look at the, uh, the CD data. And if you think back to um, one of the, the charts that Jeff put up earlier, we want to answer some of our preliminary questions. Do we have positive, positive identification that the target is a lawful military target? In this situation, we're told, yes, we do. Um, under the current ROE, are we authorized to strike this type of target, target in these conditions? And we're told, uh, yes, we're authorized to strike. Uh, do we have a, de a definitive boundary of the target? Yes, we do. And then we want to answer those last th uh, three questions, which could be showstoppers. Is, is it a dual-use target? Is it an environmental hazard or is there a plume hazard? And in all, these, in, in all three of those, the answer is no. Um, to, uh, keep this thing from getting too, to keep this problem from getting too complicated. So we're going to go look down and see the, uh, is, for the diagram, what we have is a cluster of buildings. And the blue rectangles are, represent buildings. The white uh, rectangle with the triangle in the middle represents our target. So we've got our collateral concerns, A, B, and C, and um, additionally some other buildings depending on what the, the radius of the, the expected effects are. So we go down and we look on our chart and we see that um, all three of these buildings are single-story masonry buildings with uh, target or collateral concern alpha and collateral concern bravo both 40, uh, excuse me, um, uh, collateral concern uh, alpha and collateral concern charlie both um, 40 meters away from the target and collateral concern bravo 27 meters away from the target. And the proposed weapon is a is a Mark 83. Our uh, our effects radius for virtually all for for conventional weapons in the U.S. arsenal, and we see that if we were to drop the uh, conventional weapon in the U.S. arsenal with the largest effects radius, you're going you, you see you have significant collateral concerns there. So we're not going to be able to stop at collateral uh, CDE level one. We're going to have to move on to CDE level two. And we know um, we've had proposed PGM, so level two. And you'll see the circle there. This accounts for, the, um, for any PGM within the U.S. arsenal. And that radius, we can still see that we have significant uh, collateral concerns within the radius. So we're not going to be able to start with, or we'll stop with uh, CDE level two analysis. We'll have to move on to CDE level three. Now you see when the circle is laid down for CDE level 3 and we uh, look at just the effects of particularly a Mark 83, either mitigated or unmitigated, we're still going to have significant effects on collateral structures in the area. So that tells us we're not going to be able to stop at, uh, at CDE level 3. So move on to level 4. And this is where we take into account not only the Mark 83, but the fact that the Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie are all single story masonry buildings. So uh, when you look at the collateral effects radius expected of a Mark 83 versus a single-story masonry building, we still have collateral, uh, collateral concerns. Um, can, we can still ex expect these collateral effects. So what does that tell us? It tells us we're going to have to move on to, to uh, CDE level 5. Now what do we need to know in order to conduct a CDE 5 analysis about these buildings? We need to know, first off, what each of these buildings are used for, and that's going to help us to find the appropriate values in the uh, population density tables. We need to know the size of the building so that we can calculate um, how much of it's affected. We need to know the percentage affected, and we need to know the location in relation to the inner and the outer analysts um, of, of that effects range. Now, for purposes of this, I've, uh, I'm assuming that we're going to have some values given to us by imagery analysts with regard to the size of the structures and the locations and the, uh, or the distances from the, uh, the impact and the um, percent affected. So as you see on the, um, on the population density table that we, we've put up, the functionality of uh, buildings Alpha and Charlie are both single-family urban lower class. 
the 2,000 square feet, and you'll see that the imagery analysts have given us a percentage affected. We take that percent affected, and we multiply that, and we, find, we get our uh, number of square feet affected of each of these buildings. And then under our estimated population density, and for the purposes of this, I made these numbers up for a couple reasons. One, because they vary from theater to theater. Two, that because they're classified. So these are, these are um, made up numbers. And you'll see that in Alpha and Charlie, that we can expect four, th four people per 1,000 square feet, six people per 1,000 square feet at night. And then the uh, episodic event is, is inapplicable. It's not uh, something that happens in a single family house. So you'll see as the uh, popular, as the um, worksheet, as you move from left to right on the worksheet, that we can expect that if you target alpha during the day, you're going to have two, uh, you can expect two casualties. At night, you can expect three casualties, and then an episodic event is, is inapplicable. So you look at, um, at collateral concern Bravo as well. Now that, this time it's a market, so this is a little bit different. It's still the same type of structure, but it's got a different functionality. So we can expect a different number of people in there during different times and episodic events. We're told that it's about 2,000 square feet. It's going to be about 10% affected, so there's 200 square feet. But th in this particular region, apparently markets aren't that populated during the week, so only a couple people in there at any one time during the day. At night, maybe it's just the shopkeepers coming. But in this particular area, maybe everybody gathers on Saturday morning for their weekly shopping. So we have what's called an episodic event. We can expect that on Saturday mornings, we're going to have 60 people show up at this market and be there for, uh, during that episodic event. So you do, the, um, you do the math, and what you arrive at is if you attack this, this structure, you would cause one expected casualty during the day, um, with just, just with regard to uh, collateral concern A. Or, excuse me, Clara Officer Bravo. One at night, and you'll notice that the math doesn't add up to a whole, but we always round up. Any fraction is always round up to the next whole person. But in an episodic event, uh, you would be expected to cause 12 collateral casualties. So we add each of those. We add those numbers up, working from left to right, until you get the number for each uh, each collateral concern, and then add top top to bottom. And what we arrive at is. If we attack this target with a Mark 83, what we're going to, what we can expect is during the day to have to cause uh, seven seven casual, collateral casualties at night to cause ten collateral casualties and then twelve uh, if if it were to be structured in an episodic event. So then you need to ask, what else do I need to know in order to make a collateral damage estimate? And what you need to know is that non-combatant casualty value. What is the commander set as that level before it's got to be uh, kicked up to a higher level, so to speak? And then for purposes of this problem, we've got an NCV of 8. So when you look at the, the, uh, the total columns, we can see that an episodic event and night, a night event are, uh, are not going to work because we've got an NCV of 8 and we'll find way that. But however, we are under the, est the uh, estimated casualties are under the NCV for a daytime strike. So therefore, we're going to have a casualty estimate of, or excuse me, a coronal damage estimate of a CD level 5 low required um, restrictions are PGM, Mark 83, delayed fuse. We've included a heading in there to avoid the, the uh, uh, to try to mitigate the weapons effects to the degree possible. And then we also are required to include a, a caveat, day attack only, not during an episodic event in the, in the market. And what that's going to do is that can, that's going to leave us below that NCV of 8. Any questions on that at all? Or? I guess I'm kind of curious how you understand the methodology through each of the levels, but it then gets compared to a value. And I guess my question is, where does that value come from, the NCV? And, and maybe something that can't be you know, maybe a classified process. By way. I mean, that's got to be a methodology attached to how they got to the NCV because you're doing now a comparison. I mean, the commander now does a comparison to come to an outcome of whether I'm going to approve or not approve. I think that during the stage of the operation, ma'am, you could have a, a varying level of NCV. Uh, it's, for instance, in a coin environment, there could be policy considerations that would drive that number down. It could be, uh, uh, depending on the, the stage of the operation, um, and, and I think it's, it's reflective 
this doesn't do proportionality analysis for you, but it assigns the uh, it assigns the appropriate level commander to make the decision. But what that what that does, I think, is, ref is, is reflects national policy as at, at what level do we need to rate, re we, do we need to push this targeting decision up to the highest levels to make that proportionality analysis? Right, the values would come from at least a geographic command commander, if not a higher commander, as far as establishing what that limits are. So it's basically, at this point, you're looking at between a CD5 low and a CD level 5 high, and both are at pretty uh, elevated levels of commanders that would have to prove it. But yes, the 5 high would be the highest, so it's going up uh, potentially up to the National Command Authority level to approve. So, but yes, that value would come from one of the, those high level commanders. So it's not something that's established down at a low tactical level at all. And, and I also don't, I mean, I don't believe it'd be anything that could be arrived at with any sort of mathematical yeah. equation or anything. It would be driven by law and policy. Yeah, I think, yeah, policy in particular as far as what, what the command's willing, what risk they're willing to set, to set. And so depending on the mission, right, in a coin environment, then it's probably pretty low, extremely low value can be. So, but, you know, in an international armor conflict, it may be a higher value. So it just depends. Or different stages of the conflict. All right. Uh, thought it, if there's uh, no other questions, we'd like to thank everybody and uh, just say once again, this wasn't intended to make anybody uh, CDE practitioners or experts in the area of uh, collateral damage assessment or estimation, um, but it was intended to give a, a working knowledge for somebody that needed to, that you know, wants to discuss the product outputs to understand uh, the, the process that went into giving that collateral damage estimation. Thank you.